Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation of Missouri Heart of a Nation, a virtual reality exhibition. Uh, I'm glad you guys are here, you know, and uh, yay, Missouri, 200 years, huh? We did it. We did it. We made it. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, thank you to uh, MU. Thank you to uh, Missouri uh, Historical S uh, Society um, here in this wonderful building. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you to uh, all of you guys for being here. I hope that you enjoy the weekend's activities. So uh, with that said, um, hopefully you all will be able to experience the virtual uh, reality exhibition that we put together here of uh, the Missouri Heart of a Nation collection. And hopefully you at home will experience it too as well, because it will be up on the Oculus stores uh, if you have a VR unit at home. So that should be coming soon. Um, so with that said, my name's Chip Gubera. I am a professor here at the university in the IT program. And uh, it was our group that put uh, the technology behind it, right? But uh, I'm just announcing everything here. Uh, the speakers today will be uh, Alyssa McCusker, who is the Associate Curator of the European and American Arts at the Museum of Art and Archaeology. She was uh, a big part of uh, making uh, the gallery happen. In fact, everyone up here was. And then we have Professor uh, Fong Wong, who is, teaches with me in the IT program. And uh, she was the instructor who actually, uh, uh, her class, her introduction to VR class, which is an undergraduate class, uh, are the ones that actually put this whole thing together, right? A bunch of undergraduate students put this uh, gallery together, which is pretty amazing, you know? At least I think it's pretty amazing. And then we have two students that worked on it. We have uh, Charles Sealert here, who is a recent grad of the IT program. He did all the modeling. He's going to talk about this and exactly what modeling is. And then we have Sam Nichols here, Mr. Sam Nichols, who is a current student. Uh, and he will tell you his story. He did a ton of work on this over the summer, as well as being in the class. So with that said, uh, I am going to get out of here. and. Uh, We'll let uh, everyone speak for themselves. So first off, though, we're going to have a little six-minute video about this collection, Missouri Heart of a Nation. And then uh, Alyssa will come up and talk about it. So thank you. It just always reminded me of home. For all Missouri scenes from days long ago when it was a little bit slower pace. And that was when we discovered that Amy believed that one of them reminded her very much of her great-grandfather. And I think it does showcase the way people looked at Missouri and how they wished Missouri would look. Every time I look at it, I see something different or I see something symbolic. The collection is composed of over 100 paintings created by 14 different artists. Started out with a very simple idea of selling print by regionalist artists through department stores. And those 14 artists all boasted their own styles, their own interests, and they were in general chosen to represent areas that fit with their own interests and in the work they had done in the past. And often what we see is a remarkable um, connection between the style an artist used and the subject he was depicting. These artists were producing murals. They were producing posters for the war effort. They were producing illustrations. These artists worked in any number of veins. And their art appeared in everything from the Museum of Modern Art to the local post office. It was commissioned as the Heart of the Nation collection but it was created at the behest of a gentleman named Reeves Leventhal. And so Leventhal began shopping the idea of creating specific collections for department stores. They would commission the works, and then they would include them in their retail spaces. That was supposed to help the shoppers see this as their department store. From the standpoint of regionalists, it was also supposed to get major art from major artists into venues where it was immediately acceptable and everyone could see it. And the result is a set of paintings that depict life across
across Missouri, what people in some ways expect to see in Missouri, as well as perhaps what they don't expect to see. It really highlights not only what people of Missouri thought of Missouri, but also what people in the nation thought of Missouri. In 1947, the collection is completed. It's transferred to the department store. And they put it on display, first in their stores, and then it travels all around the Midwest. Eventually, a decision is made that it has to go somewhere else. I'm Dr. Elmer Ellis became aware of the collection and felt that it would be a good addition to the University of Missouri art collections. So he contacted the department store, the possibility of them donating the collection to the university, which ultimately they did. And after extensive discussions and correspondence, a decision is made that it will be transferred in its entirety. And in the fall of 1950, it finally arrives. This had a number of benefits. First, it meant it was a donation to a public institution. It would retain some kind of visibility for the collection. It also meant that it stayed public. So it, it moved from being accessible in a department store to being accessible in an institution of higher education. The goal was to have a department store in every state sponsor this kind of collection. It only happened in about three or four. So what we have here in Missouri is extremely special. As an anthropologist, my main interest is in the life history of objects. And as a museum director, I'm interested in the life history of collections. So when these individual paintings became the Scruggs van der Berg Barney collection, the Heart of the Nation collection, they went from being individual depictions of places in the Missouri landscape to being a cohesive collection that had its own life history. So while it's this wonderful picture of Missouri and it's very intimate and it seems very regional, and while it looks true, it's an interpretation. So we see in a lot of these paintings the real transition from a pre-war to a post-war America and uh, an image of Missouri that we want to hold dear versus the one that's emerging. And I'm thrilled that my students have access to that because what better way to kind of bring students into their own history than to have them engage with these paintings. Kristen Schwein and her students are also doing a website through the museum which will include images of the paintings, the context of the paintings, the locations of the paintings, and it's designed to be a living document. The other thing we can do now is really begin to take advantage of new technologies. We can actually make this more public and more part of the public conversation than it's ever been before. Until the end of World War II, regionalism was really what there was of it in American art. It was probably the most dominant style, certainly it was the most publicly recognized style. We're only now reaching a point where we can look back on that period and see it with fresh eyes. And for that, there's probably no single more important collection anywhere in the country than the Heart of the Nation collection. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here um, to be introducing this project, introducing this collection to those of you who are not already familiar with it. Many of you are. Um, any of you who went, wandered through Jesse Hall at some point um, before 2014 would have seen this work um, gracing the walls of that um, esteemed building. Um, I also am, am just um, really honored to be representing the museum at this particular event. Um, in, in our current circumstances, our museum is closed. We are moving, we are relocating back to campus. Um, that film was made uh, some years back when we were still in Mizzou North, which we still are, but we are currently packing um, and relocating. Um, and this kind of exhibition with all that video is actually inaccurate. It's not over 100 paintings. It is just about 100 paintings um, and drawings, 98 works in total, um, with one work actually missing, 
um, it was stolen from Jesse Hall in 1995. So um, if you see any works by Aaron Bowrod floating around depicting Main Street in Kansas City in beautiful color, we would love it back. <laughs> Um, it's, it's listed with the FBI uh, art loss register, um, and, and the art loss register, I should say. In any case, that's a, a drier note to start on. Um, so 98 paintings total um, by 14 different artists, and in many ways this collection and its history, as our former director Alex Barker was talking about in the film, um, is really a great metaphor for our museum as well, and for museums in general around the world. So. These artists came from all different areas of the United States. Some of them also were immigrants, um, first generation Americans from Belgium, from Germany, um, and from Russia who participated in this project. Um, I, I mean, in the original project in, in uh, 1946 and 1947. Um, and so bringing all of these talents together to create this, this vision of Missouri in 98 works. Um, and then those traveled around the state for a couple of years, as the video mentions. Um, and ultimately were donated to the museum, as we learned in the video in 1950, um, and were housed in Jesse Hall um, from then on. And I, I mentioned the work that is missing because um, it's it's indicative of sort of the vulnerability of, of these kinds of works of art. So gratefully, the, um, from a curator's perspective, uh, the university decided to rehouse this collection in our museum where we can ensure its preservation for generations to come, um, making sure that it has the proper climate controls and lighting and exhibition um, practices all, all around it. Um, so this project that I'm talking about today um, is, um, is, was born sort of on the fly in many cases, <laughs> very fortuitously, very, a very happy sort of accident that all of this came together. Um, thinking about this particular bicentennial event um, and trying to uh, bridge the museum, the art world with the technical, the, you know, the school of, or the college of engineering at the University of Missouri. Um, so I, I, I bring in this map, which in, in part of my research of this collection, um, and I am not a native Missourian, I have to say. I am from Minnesota. So part of my learning about this collection was to learn where these works are from. Where were these, uh, these artists traveling to? Um, and, in, and I created a Google map, which is what this is. And this is also accessible. Um, I have it fully accessible online. If if you would, if you're so interested, I can send you the link. Um, you know, at, at the end of our talks today, um, but you can click on each one of these locations. Each color is a different artist represented in the collection, and then um, it will actually, in some cases, take you down to a street view, because with the technology of Google Earth, I was able to pinpoint in some cases exactly where the artist was standing when he was painting um, or drawing a particular scene in this collection. Um, it, the, you can see over here, there's a cluster at Kansas City and a cluster in St. Louis. Those were focal points for a number of artists. As you can see, I've, I've got a zoomed in map here for you to see, for those of you who are familiar with these two, uh, the two largest cities here in our state. Um, but I, I, a few years ago, I attended a great workshop about the digital humanities at Duke University. And the takeaway for me um, from that entire experience was that um, digital humanities is wonderful. It's a buzzword. We, we love to throw it around because we're trying to uh, find new ways to bridge the humanities and technology, right? I get that. And that's wonderful and exciting. Um, but what my takeaway was that the any projects in, in digitization really and technology really should be in service of the humanities. Your starting point should be what kind of humanistic questions are you asking? And um, th uh, this project that, that we'll be talking about more today um, really is, I think, the epitome of how um, asking questions or figuring out uh, asking humanistic questions and then figuring out how digital technology can serve to answer those 
is really remarkable um, because this is an exhibition that could not exist. Right now, we do not have the kind of space um, in our museum to house this. We would have to essentially deinstall our entire permanent collection to display these works. Um, I've also was able to have um, perfectly modeled and designed gallery spaces for individual themes. Um, and this, this particular map also informed the design, um, the sort of meaningful symbolic design behind it in the sense that we took some of these particular places from, um, uh, from the map of Missouri and used this in our lobby for the central sculpture that you'll see, which, ro which actually rotates in the VR experience. Uh, this is just a screenshot. Um, but just to show you that this is directly tied to these works and the, the meaning of these works is, is, you know, directly rooted in this particular project. So um, I curated an exhibition. Like I said, I was able to create the sort of galleries that I wanted. Um, and I chose uh, seven different themes, all of which really overlap because, of course, you can have lots of representations of rivers in St. Louis, right? Because um, of the, the, the Mississippi, of course, is at the heart of St. Louis and the East. Um, and the, the Missouri runs, the Missouri River runs, you know, south of, uh, southwest of, of the city of St. Louis and so on. Um, and then I was able to pick my own gallery colors, which is <laughs> phenomenally interesting because rather than having to, you know, laboriously paint every single wall, um, we were just able to, uh, by the entering different numbers from Pantone, we were able to change the gallery walls. Um, so I just want to go through some of these images, um, allow this to kind of run through while I, while I talk a little bit. Um, so these 14 artists, um, as I mentioned, all, all of them American artists, three of them were, um, were immigrants, one from Belgium, one from Germany and, or, or Prussia, one from uh, Russia. And we're brought together on this project um, by a department store. And this may seem very peculiar to us today because, you know, Macy's is not, you know, contacting Anish Kapoor to come and do anything for them. Um, but at the time, and, and sort of moving out of the Depression era and the post-war era, this was actually um, a very common, uh, not very common, that makes it sound like it, you could just get it anywhere, but it was a, a trend among department stores um, that as part of, the, the sort of burgeoning of arts and culture that happened as a direct result of New Deal programs and New Deal programs for artists under the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, and, and various other sort of um, forms of that, that uh, name of that, that, that organization that they had over the years. Um, you know, this really, this coalesced artists in particular locations. And it also spread like New York City or uh, Los Angeles, what have you, San Francisco, but it also spread them out across the country, painting murals for post offices, um, helping design, um, you know, library spaces and, and so on and so forth. So, so this kind of art was something that was really experienced by a generation across the US, um, everywhere. It was really quite, quite astonishing and remarkable. And with the war and the end of the war, World War II, um, you know, these artists sort of come back and, uh, or, or are still, you know, here in the US um, and are, are looking for new opportunities and new work. And they'd had all these opportunities before to sort of make a name for themselves. And that's, that's kind of this, cult, this generation of artists is really, um, is really the WPA generation, we could say. Um, so a number of the artists are actually uh, either from Missouri or were involved here in Missouri. They taught um, at, at um, different institutions of art here in the state or were students of um, notable artists here in the state. For example, uh, Fred Shane uh, taught here at the University of Missouri. Um, artists like Frederick James and Jackson Lee Nesbitt were pupils of probably the one of, I mean, one of the two most famous Missouri artists, Thomas Hart Benton. Um, they studied with him in Kansas City at the Art Institute. 
Um, and you may, as, as we're going through this, and if you experience the exhibition, you may notice that Thomas Hardbenton himself is absent. Um, he was invited to contribute to the project um, and uh, was sort of dismayed that artists from other states were invited to participate. He thought it should be an all Missouri cast <laughs> um, and he refused. So uh, instead we have this representation of artists from a generation younger than Thomas Hart Benton. So artists that are starting to also push the envelope a little bit in terms of uh, modernism and abstraction, um, definitely working in a regionalist vein. We've, you, we heard that word a lot in the video. Um, regionalism is a style of art that is, it's a truly American style of art. Um, so focused on depicting life as you experience it, even everyday or mundane sort of activities, um, and represented in a style that is um, realistic, nat what we might say realistic or naturalistic. So they're depicting the world uh, fairly accurately, but they're also adding, um, they're, in, they're using their own particular personal style to add symbolic elements here. So the, the colors that we see, for example, in this image of um, these images from, from Kansas City, um, really speak to Aaron Bowrod's kind of experience of being um, in these parks or these zoo, you know, the, the park that would eventually become the Kansas City Zoo, um, or the chilliness of a Christmas, you know, Christmas shopping in downtown, downtown Kansas City. Um, so I, I hope that you will have an opportunity to view this exhibition um, in VR. It's also something that thanks to a grant um, through this program um, that the State Historical Society has organized for the Bicentennial that we will have a headset at the museum um, from now on with this exhibition on it. So not only will visitors be able to see it, it will be, it will be even more publicly available um, than it already is, uh, but also just an extraordinary pedagogical tool for us um, in training art historians and also in training students in engineering and IT. Um, so I, I just want to tell, tell you how grateful I am to be part of this project um, and to have been able to work with all these extraordinary um, faculty and, and students on this. So um, I will... Uh, I would be happy to introduce then um, Fang Wang, who is a, a professor of IT uh, at, the, at the College of Engineering, um, who will tell us a little bit more about sort of how this project came to be in, in her hands, right, and how she um, worked on it from her side. So humanist, art historian, engineer, <laughs> Techno technician extraordinaire. <laughs> The Museum of Art and Archaeology at the University of Missouri preserves a collection of artworks that allows us a remarkable glimpse of Missouri in the mid 20th century. In 1946 and 1947, they hired 14 artists to travel across Missouri, quote, to depict the natural beauties, industrial activities, and cultural characteristics of the state, end quote. The patrons named their collection Missouri, Heart of the Nation. In honor of the Missouri Bicentennial, we present this entire collection in the modern format of a virtual reality exhibition. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fang. Uh, I'm a faculty member at IT program in the College of Engineering. So today I will actually introduce 
the, pro the project. We work together um, with uh, Historic Society, a Museum of Art and Archaeology, uh, to put this VR gallery together. So as Alyssa had pointed out, it's this uh, project almost born by uh, accident on the fly. But then when I was sitting there and thinking back, I felt like it's not just accident, right? Actually, all the components that eventually made this uh, uh, project possible were already there. Uh, so, first, let's, let me talk about the, the technology behind this. Uh, the virtual reality, uh, or you know, um, VR, we called it, uh, is a very new technology, right? Um, so when we start uh, our in our program, we start to offer a class in 2016. We had a very humble start. We start with five computers in a very small lab, and then now it has grown into um, this new VR lab that's hosted uh, located in La Fair Hall. Uh, many of you, uh, I would invite you to come visit us for, you know, we are going to put, uh, put on this exhibit today uh, in, the, in this location. So the room consists, uh, have 21 VR-ready workstations. Uh, the one on the left is the classroom. That's where the VR class take place. Uh, the picture on the right is actually the room next door. That's where, you know, more in-depth project uh, student uh, taking on research project, individual project, or capstone project, we actually utilize the other room. Um, so with the facility ready, we also have uh, quite a few courses contributed to the uh, educate or train our students to be able to uh, put this project together. So some of the, pro the t courses we have uh, like introduction to virtual reality, game development, modeling, animation, and many other courses uh, that actually um, build the skill sets that students need um, for this project. So uh, for the, pro Wait, this can play. Actually, this is a video, um, one of our project that is a basketball game, and we actually uh, use those student project you know, for community engagement. Here actually is uh, probably middle school students coming in to visit in our VR lab and was playing the game. We also conduct a lot of research uh, in the, using the facility. So for instance, um, most of our uh, current research are on using VR technology for education. Uh, so here, I don't know if this probably, this is a video, but it seems like this only uh, is uh, right now showing as a picture. We have a lot of engineering labs, right? Um, you know, traditionally our education are mostly um, contained in a 2D space, right? So you look at the book, you use your computer. But here we are able to bring you another dimension. So VR many times are considered as a spatial computing because we are able to put you in a 3D environment. Uh, the hope is, or our you know, uh, first impression is, this will actually improve the education. You get to do things, right? Um, not necessarily have to be in a physical space, but in a virtual space. This helps us a lot of times, the certain, for example, labs, you can uh, practice at home, right? but also you actually can, uh, some of the equipment are not widely available. There's probably only one, this type of settings in the uh, whole engineering, because they are expensive, hard to maintain, uh, things like that. So now we can actually bring those into the students, uh, to their home, on their fingertips. However, you know, everything has two, two sides, right? So not only that it will help you learn, but the other part is we have started to observe that this actually, again, add a, a cog cognitive load onto the people because it's not completely natural. For instance, things that you do in your daily life, you pick up things with your hand, right? You are easily doing that. But here, 
we have to go using a hand controller, right? as some of you may have already seen that. So it's not a act, actually a natural activity. But our research has found that the benefit of using the virtual reality is far beyond those co cognitive load people had to acquire, right? Um, so that's some of the research project we did. Um, we actually have been already um, fairly active in terms of uh, com community engagement. Um, I think this also contributed to the fact that we took on this project. Here are just some pictures showing this still, uh, this the lab, our old lab in the engineering building north. Uh, we have a lot of students visiting us and uh, we were told we are the place that um, it's hard to get them to leave. They stay, right? Um, so a lot of them, not only we show that the commercially, commercially available program, but the, we actually let them see what our students build. Okay, I think that makes a lot of difference, but then that's actually a good uh, conversation starter. They start to ask, right, how can I do that? So we can start talking about the courses you might need to take, right, get them interested. Uh, so here, the, I have one minute, one minute remaining. Let me talk about how we get onto this project. Um, I think, uh, so there's three components, right? From the historic society, I think they had the vision, the drive. Uh, Beth and uh, Michael uh, came up with the idea of having this VR gallery. And then we have Alisa, actually her dedication uh, you know, she uh, picked and designed the whole museum, right? The, as she pointed out, the color, how to place those paintings. And then we have the course and students' talent to put all this together. Um, so I implement this into uh, my class. Um, it's, you know, actually we were approached probably in January this year. The class has already started. So I had to actually work with uh, uh, Chip and my teaching assistant, Scott. Some of you may see him today in the lab. We designed this uh, project, right? I'm not very confident at the time. So what we decided to do it is uh, as a midterm project. Each of my students get one room only, okay? We have seven um, uh, gallery rooms. So each student team get one room only, they put on the the paintings, and by the midterm time, they were only um, capable of doing very basic VR um, development. So the design was mostly just using eyes to interact. You are able to move around only using your eyes. Uh, here, actually, the pictures is after the midterm, we brought in Michael, Beth, Lisa, and everyone. And as you can see, they were very impressed. And I, my confidence also um, rise up because I see my students are able to do it. This is probably the first time we collaborate with um, people from with art background. Uh, so moving forward to the final, we had been able to put together the museum and assign my students' team, each one of them, the whole museum. I gave them the guidelines, but they are the one that put in those uh, features. They have their created creativity. Um, so not only we are using, we design two modes. You can use your eyes only, or you can use a hand controller to have a little more interaction, a magnifier, you know, things like that. Uh, so, so my student here, uh, Sam and um, uh, Charles, are gonna dive into the details how they actually, you know, put those projects together, um, you know, in uh, this. Um, I, I, I'm very, very uh, excited to see how it turned out to be. Um, so thank you, everybody. So, Charles? Okay. Give me just one second here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Charles Allen Sealant. I am a Missouri, University of Missouri graduate. I graduated in December of 2020, and my focus on this project was 3D design. So what that means is essentially what I needed to do on the project was to focus on the visuals and the layout of the structure, 
the uh, look and overall feel of the um, museum itself. So one thing I would like to begin discussing about is how to create virtual worlds by mixing 3D design and architecture together. So what does that mean? Well, uh, in a program such as the one you're viewing here on the screen, which is uh, Blender, we design and create the geometric shapes, the uh, overall look of certain um, things that lay out on top of those geometric shapes, which we call textures, which will be used for things such as the overall look and feel and design of a wall. So from everything as small as the um, chairs that we sit in to things as giant as the rooms that we go into and walk around in, these are the things I focus on and I need to focus on them to the point where it goes down to their exact dimensions. And as you can see there, there are uh, some examples of some um, designs, some room layouts that I studied and had to correlate to my designs from the museum itself. So uh, a bit of uh, backstory into why I focus on these specific things such as 3D design and architecture. Uh, when I came to Mizzou in the fall of 2015, I was originally going into architecture design. So what that, event, what that essentially means is that I was uh, focusing on things such as the overall look and design of buildings and the structure of them uh, as a whole. But uh, as time went on, I quickly found that my interest uh, went towards more of the design and um, computer side of things. So I went into uh, information technology since that, uh, in my opinion, had the best of both worlds. I could design and plan out things according to the um, programs and computer uh, algorithms that I used. And uh, from 2019 to 2020 was a very important year for me because I was focusing on the research projects that I was uh, under with uh, Professor Fong. And so what I would do is I would take my time to understand how a building is laid out, the structure of how a person moves from one place to another in those buildings, and essentially how to define them in a way that's interesting and unique. So when you create a building, essentially you want there to be a purpose for that building and structure in the first place, but you want it in a way that allows a person to come into that structure and know where they're going, but also make it look visually unique as well. So that was the things I was focusing on for almost a full year. I was also under a teaching position with uh, Chip Gubera, so that was a great time to help study uh, the design and uh, layout of uh, the programs used alongside those 3D design programs. And in 2020, uh, December, I graduated from the IT program. So uh, to go into briefly some of the programs that I used, I use a 3D design program called Blender, which I, again, I showcased at the very beginning. Um, the material and uh, the material design program called Substance, which are a series of programs which allow for the creation of high detailed textures and materials, which again are used to create the very detailed services from wood to metal to steel, you name it. Uh, Photoshop and Adobe, the uh, creative suites from Adobe are very helpful in these uh, types of situations where you need to specify a specific texture or uh, the layout of a certain structure. Planning, designing, you name it, they do it. And uh, not only that, but um, I also helped out uh, Sam and uh, Scotty, the uh, head developers on this project alongside myself with the uh, UI elements, uh, things on the screens that people will interact with as they move through the experience. So defining clear and uh, interactable objects that people can understand the meaning behind is very important, and those programs allow you to do it very easily. So um, in terms of my focus and goals for this project, um, my first one is going to be uh, actually, yes, excuse me, so 3D design, I, I want to go on to this briefly before I go into architecture. The uh, importance with 3D design with regards to architecture is that um, in order to plan out the layout of a building, you first have to create that building through the geometric shapes. So those programs that I listed previously come in handy with that uh, quite significantly. And with the very basic geometric shapes, you can see an example on the right-hand side of the mall's layout very early on in the project. So um, as I've said before, Architecture uh, with regards to 3D design involves uh, planning out their rooms ahead of time, the overall structure and layout, uh, and over time improving on their designs. As I'll go into briefly, the designs of the, uh, excuse me, the museum itself uh, changes significantly throughout the months that I've worked on the project. So uh, what I would do is I would uh, suggest changes to the structure itself, 
give their uh, different areas to go into for the player to explore for uniqueness and to give some realism to a building. Because when you come into a structure such, such as this building, you're met with a lobby, nice designs, a stairwell leading up to a, another floor, a bathroom, so on and so forth. These are the things I have to think about and if they're practical to the project that we're working on. So um, many things didn't make the cut uh, for simplicity's sake, but also to avoid uh, confusion. Because that's an important thing to think about, is that when a person comes to, into a scene like this, it's like coming into a building. You need to be uh, aware of your layout and also not be overwhelmed by too many things all at once, since many of the people going into this experience, it will be their first time in VR. So you have to ease them into it. So many uh, things didn't make the cut, such as the uh, second floor that you'll see here. That uh, was actually a doorway leading to a stairwell, such as this uh, one outside the uh, lobby here. Uh, that would lead up to a second floor. So there would be verticality to the building itself. It would have a multi-function layout, some uh, exhibits on the bottom floor and some on the second. So that couldn't stay. But as you'll see on this slide, you'll see what did and uh, didn't change. So the overall layout of the rotunda lobby itself hasn't changed. That has pretty much stayed all throughout the design. Um, I should mention starting off in mid-March was when I was brought into the project. And I started off with this and the... Uh, Exhibits, very basic geometric shapes, untextured and un, uh, undes not, didn't have any detail at all. And uh, as time moved on into early April, I increased the uh, visual fidelity and detail of these rooms as well by putting in things such as um, glass uh, railing systems so that the person could be guided through the uh, lobby itself in a natural way. But as time went on, we decided that this was too complicated. So we cut a lot of things out. We made the lobby itself wider. And um, as you can see on the very final design there, we have a nice, very cool looking statue that I will talk about uh, uh, here in just a second while I finish up uh, talking about the design of these rooms themselves. So the uh, exhibits themselves went through a similar process mid-March. They would go through an initial uh, design phase where uh, as through the following months uh, into April, into May, June, they would be refined and they would be given different uh, lighting properties as well since lighting as I'm sure many of you are aware, is very important within a museum setting. So we didn't want it to be too dark, we didn't want it to be too light, and we decided on the very final design that that is what we wanted to go with. So um, before I decide to talk, before I talk about the Unity engine real quick and what it has towards our project, I want to talk about the importance of uh, the very center uh, structure here, or the statue itself. So uh, this was something I was very happy with uh, designing because um, as Alyssa has gone into, the um, locations of the uh, portraits that you'll see throughout this gallery are important with regards to our state's um, history and whatnot. And so uh, when designing a uh, centerpiece for this uh, rotunda, I decided to go with something, something as simple as a relief uh, statue of the Missouri state itself alongside the identified uh, blips, as you'll see in the very middle there, you can see the lights where those uh, portraits come from. I thought it was very important to identify those places so that they, in this experience, are forever remembered and that they are given significance. So, um, I don't have too much time here, so I'll make this brief. So the Unity Engine with regards to our project is a thing that we are able to bring our assets into, our 3D assets and textures and all of our other things and bring it together in a way that functions and allows for incredible customization and creation uh, abilities. Uh, there's so many different ways to make an experience that there's almost, you can't create the exact same experience twice. And so um, thanks to Sam and Scotty, they've been able to create so much functionality in this project with regards to my creations and whatnot alongside them because you can't have an experience without functionality. The, 3D design elements there are just for show at that point if you don't have a way to interact with them, which is very important to do in a project such as this because you want the person to be able to interact with the objects, such as right here, because that immerses the player in the world that they're going into. Not only do they go into the museum expecting to see these portraits that they may otherwise not see in the real life, but they're able to go up to it and interact it with the functionality that they've given. And I, I think that's absolutely incredible in a portable vir uh, virtual sense to be able to experience these whenever you want and to go up to them and to see their very fine details. I think that's just incredible that we can are, are able to do that in this day and age. 
And so um, <clears throat> to wrap it up here, since I'm almost out of time, um, with regards to everything else, I think that uh, it was an incredible honor working on this project. I had such a great time with regards to fleshing out the environments and working alongside Scotty, Sam, and everyone else just to make this experience as special as possible. Um, I truly believe that things such as this allow for the fostering of um, creation and ideation. I truly believe this is like the best way to learn about things around you or concepts you otherwise may not know. So uh, to hand it off to Sam, he's going to tell you a bit about how he built out the functionality of the project, and he's going to really shed some light on how amazing this all works. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Sam Nichols. I'm an undergraduate student here at the University of Missouri. Uh, I was in Fong's Intro to VR class this semester, and I was the back-end developer for the Missouri Heart of the Nation virtual exhibit. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about my experience as a student uh, building the museum and kind of everything that took place. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of my mindset going into the class and how it changed over time um, and then kind of the timeline of the project and how everything happened and then a couple of the challenges we faced along the way and how we overcame them. Uh, so my first day in the Intro to VR class, um, I kind of took the class uh, because I needed credits. I wasn't really interested in VR <laughs> uh, or game development. I, di I didn't even know what Unity was. I had never used a game development software. Um, I wasn't a very strong coder, and I kind of just wanted to take the class and move on and do cybersecurity. Um, fast forward six months to today, uh, I have worked with an amazing team uh, building a professional art museum. I've spent hundreds of hours using the Unity software. Uh, I've become a much stronger coder, and now I'm actually starting to consider game development for my future. So uh, that's obviously a, a big change in six months. Uh, so uh, now how we got there, uh, it kind of all started with the midterm project. Uh, when it got time for it, we were kind of like starting to ask questions what it was going to be like. And they were kind of like, we're going to do something different this year. We're really not sure if it's anything. Uh, it might be something. And then, and then the idea of building the museum was announced. And uh, we split into teams. And they gave us a room to work with and put the paintings in and kind of do some gaze-based teleportation inside of it. Um, really kind of just the basic stuff that we knew how to do at the time. Um, and they were like, you know, if this does turn into a project or into like an official project uh, and we like your room enough, it's actually going to be inside of the museum. So it kind of gave us some incentive to do well. Um, and then fast forward to the end of the semester, uh, the museum's now an official project. Um, we work in teams of two again, uh, but this time we're building the entire museum. So we uh, went to work on building the seven rooms. Uh, and kind of designing full functionality for the museum as much as we could. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of that in there. Um, and then we actually presented it to, uh, to Fong and to Alyssa um, and got some feedback on kind of where we've come throughout the semester and kind of the progress we've made and what we've, you know, kind of helping us realize what we've been able to achieve. And, uh, that's when Fong actually told us, you know, whoever's interested in continuing working on this to come let her know. And uh, within two weeks, I was <laughs> setting up my computer in the VR lab to start working on this project. So very exciting. So uh, now I kind of want to talk about the, the different phases of planning that went into this project uh, or the, the timeline. So the, the first phase that we kind of had was the planning phase. And in this time, I went and looked through all of the students' final projects and kind of figured out which project was going to be the baseline, which one we'd start with and build off of. Um, and then the other projects, which ones we would take functionality out of and put into the one we're starting with. Um, and that took about two weeks to figure out. Um, and we had a great, a great start. Um, 
and we had a lot of meetings uh, about kind of everything we wanted to add to it, and then it was time to get to implementing it. Uh, and this is where I wrote most of the code for the museum, uh, just kind of defining all of the interactions you'd be able to have in it, um, all of the movement uh, and all the painting interactions. Um, and this is also where I worked a lot with Chip and Charles, uh, kind of creating the UI, uh, the experience for the player, um, and balancing that with um, the design of the place to make it all flow and make it, make it a truly immersive experience. And then the last phase of the project, um, which actually ended up taking until about three days ago, <laughs> Uh, was the polishing phase, which is where after everything's been implemented and everything is great and works, we you know are trying to get it to the Oculus Store, which had a lot of um, specifications that we didn't actually uh, look at in advance, <laughs> and we had a lot of things we had to change uh, and just improve to you know make sure it met all the technical requirements. Um, and during that time just fixing the little things that came up and doing a lot of user testing um, and making sure that it was ready for this event. And you know, it, it's pretty cool, honestly. Uh, so now I wanna talk about kind of three of the different main ideas and functionality that I put into the museum and that we all worked on. Um, and so the first one's gonna be movement systems, the user interface, and then the paintings themselves. So in the class, we learned about two different kinds of movement systems. And one is, the first one is controller-based movement, where you actually use the controller joysticks to move around the physical environment. Um, and it's a very fluid, you know, kind of like walking, except you're standing in place. Um, and then the teleportation-based movement, uh, where you use teleport, an teleport anchors to move to different spots around your environment. And a, you have a lot of control over what you can let the player do and what they're not allowed to do. Um, and so the way that the, the museum was designed with uh, the eight different rooms, uh, they were all separate rooms, not really connected to each other. So it kind of made our choice easy here uh, to go with the teleportation um, so that if you, like, if you look down the hallway, um, you would then get like teleported into the room and then you could move around that room and look at all of the art there. Um, and so the, the, one of the main difficulties we had with this was that if someone hasn't used a VR headset, uh, it's very easy for them to get motion sick. Uh, so kind of figuring out a way to do the movement without, you know, while counteracting the motion sickness uh, was a big thing that we had to focus on. And it took a, about two weeks to figure out, but we, we ended up making the, a, a fade in and fade out uh, function for the teleportation that you know, counteracts motion sickness and provides a very fluid experience in, in the museum. Um, so moving on to the user interface uh, or UI. The UI is everything that you'll interact with your environment. Um, and it facilitates the whole experience of, of, the, of the museum. Um, it's uh, super important um, and um, is used, shoot, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, it, so it facilitates the museum experience and uh, the, the biggest challenge we had with this was uh, implementing it in a seamless, uh, easy, and intuitive uh, way into the museum uh, in a way that anticipates the user's needs so that um, if they're you know, in a room and they want to quickly get to a different room, they can look down at their menu and pull up the map and use the map to you know, move to a different room. And that's all using UI. Um, and then I wanted to talk about my favorite uh, and probably one of the most important UI elements in this museum, and that is buttons. Um, I went and counted, and I did the, you know, I counted how many buttons were in the museum, and there are over 680 
buttons in this museum controlling all of the functionality. Um, and so the thing that's really important about them is that you can attach your scripts to them so that anytime the buttons are pressed, um, they execute whatever, whatever code you're using, whatever you want to happen to the player um, and really just you know, makes the project complete. Um, so yeah, that was a very important part. And then the, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the paintings themselves. And so obviously the, the experience you have looking at the paintings is the most important part of this project. So we wanted to make sure that it was flawless, um, all of your interactions with the painting. So the museum is split into two different modes. One is controlled with your, with your gaze, with your eyes, uh, and the other one is controlled using a controller. Uh, so in the gaze side, you actually have a little cursor that shows you um, what, what, so, uh, what place you're actually looking at. Um, and obviously when you're looking at the painting, you don't want to have that in the way. Uh, so we had to design a way to make that go away while you're looking at the painting uh, so that you have an unobstructed view of it. Uh, and then in the controller side, you don't have that. So we wanted to add a little bit of functionality to it, make it a more immersive experience. So we added the magnifying glass so you can get a very, very up close view of the painting. Um, and it actually is so close that you can see some of the brush strokes that the artist made. So it's, it's very cool. Um, and then every, every art museum I've ever been to has, has like the small labels next to the painting with a bunch of information that's really hard to read. Uh, <laughs> so so we, wanted to, we wanted to find a way to work around that. So we still have those labels in there, um, but they just have the name of the painting on them. And then when you uh, when you look at the label or, or interact with it using a button, uh, it'll bring up a much larger label that has all of the information on it about the paintings. So uh, just kind of extra functionality there, really making it easier to read the, all the information you want about the painting. And then to kind of wrap up, uh, I'm gonna, uh, what now, uh, what I'm gonna be doing from here on out now that this project is done, um, I'm going to be TAing for the Intro to VR class. Um, hopefully, I can uh, pass on a little bit of the knowledge that I've gained to them. Um, and then also, I'm going to be doing research for Fong as well this semester, um, you know, using, using the skills that I've learned to hopefully do more good. So um, yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, Sam has come a long way from uh, wandering into a VR class to uh, becoming an expert in like no time at all. We're very proud of him. Proud of you too, Charles. We're proud of all of our students. Um, this experience, this exhibition here, is one of the, the greatest uh, projects that I've ever worked on. I'm very, very and deeply proud of it, you know, and it's been great getting to work with Alyssa, working with Fong on a totally different level from how we usually work together, and of course, working with uh, students, former and present. Uh, it's been wonderful. So I really hope you all come by and experience this, this gallery that we're all so very, very proud of. Sadly, we've run out of time for any questions and answers because we have to open up this thing, right? So if you have questions and you'd like to talk more about it, come see us in the basement of Laffrey Hall, right? That's where we are. And uh, we'll also have stations set up in Jesse Hall as well, which hopefully everyone knows where Jesse is if you're fearing Laffrey. With Laffrey, there should be signs up and everything. So we're open today from like here in about five minutes till two, and then tomorrow from 12 to noon, okay? Both in Jesse Hall, or I'm sorry, 12 noon to four, rather, 12 to noon. <laughs> I wish, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah, so come by and see us, right? We're happy to answer questions and uh, you know, take a tour of the gallery. It's fun. If you've never had VR before, this is a good first experience for you guys, right? So thank you very much. Thank you to Beth Pike and Michael Sweeney and the 2021 people. And uh, thank you, State of Missouri, 200 years, right? Yay. Thank you very much.